The Manhattan Project, named by Colonel James Marshall in the 18th story of a Manhattan office building in June of 1942. It was the nickname for the United States Atomic Bomb Development Project that began in 1939. Led by United States top scientists with support from Canada and the United Kingdom, the code name for this project was Manhattan, which replaced development of substitute materials in the early 1940s. The Manhattan Project was headed by theoretical physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer and his team of scientists and engineers were tasked with designing and building a working atomic bomb, capable of wiping out hundreds of thousands if necessary. The atomic bomb was fueled by nuclear fission, discovered by German scientists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. According to the United States Energy Information Association, nuclear fission is a process in which the nucleus of an atom, typically uranium, is bombarded by neutrons, and the nucleus splits into two equally sized nuclei, which creates an unstable exothermic chain reaction. The Manhattan Project was not completed by one man, but a crew of scientists who operated all over the country and worked towards cracking the code of nuclear warfare. They had labs in Chicago, Rochester, New York, Washington, D.C., St. Louis, and Berkeley. However, the main lab was in Los Alamos, New Mexico. The most notable scientist to work on the Manhattan Project was Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was the head scientist at the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, and he is known as the father of the atomic bomb for his contributions towards the atomic project. The Trinity test was the first time an atomic bomb was ever launched, and after viewing the destruction, Oppenheimer said, He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Oppenheimer and the other scientists of the Manhattan Project created a machine so deadly that they did not know the scale of how dangerous it could be. What you are about to witness is the destructive force of an atomic bomb. The Trinity test was the first successful test of atomic power and this video captures the destruction and chaos that comes with it. When World War II was won, the bombs had been dropped, and the Japanese had surrendered, Oppenheimer was appointed the position of chairman on the General Advisory Committee of the United States Atomic Energy Commission. Here, he continuously lobbied against the extension of developing the atomic and hydrogen bombs, as well as lobbying for international control of nuclear power. The man who had created nuclear destruction fought against its development. It all led to this. After a brutally long war in the Pacific Theater, America thought it was time to end. 
They had been fighting for years, and with Hitler committing suicide on April 30th of 1945, the Germans had surrendered a week later. For three more months, Japan and America continued to fight on the beaches and in the air. Japan was beginning to run out of resources, so they had begun using a principle called kamikaze warfare. Kamikaze was the act of using all of a pilot's fuel and bullets, and then they would use the last missile they had, the aircraft and themselves. The Japanese warrior class had a code called Bushido. This code dates back to the 8th century and emphasized honor and loyalty above all else. Many believe this is why Japanese pilots began kamikaze attacks. The Allied powers knew this was a problem, and they needed to find a different solution. They had prepared to invade Japan, but the Japanese saw the United States' plan coming. They had prepared counterattacks, and on June 15, 1945, a study by the Joint War Plans Committee estimated the invasion, codenamed Operation Olympic, set to begin on, in October of 1945, would result in at least 130,000 United States casualties. So, the United States began to perform air raids on Japan's major cities. This process had been occurring for a few years before the atomic bombs and consisted mainly of firebombing. The process of firebombing worked especially well in Japan's major cities like Tokyo and Kyoto due to many civilian buildings being constructed of wood and other easily flammable materials. However, the Japanese continued without hindrance. Before the bombs were dropped in 1945, Hiroshima was the seventh most populated city in Japan, with an estimated 255,000 people living there. In Nagasaki, the population was estimated at 195,000. Eventually, with the combination of Operation Olympic poised to fail and the firebombings continuously showing no success, the Allied powers realized they resulted in a last resort. At this point, the Manhattan Project had successfully split the atom, and they had achieved nuclear capabilities. Two bombs were prepared, the Little Boy and the Fat Man. These bombs were compared to the power of TNT, or dynamite. The first bomb, the Little Boy, was equivalent in power to 15,000 tons of TNT, and it was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. An estimated 150,000 people were killed, some instantly and some after excruciating radi radiation poisoning. Less than a week later, on August 9, 1945, the Allied powers dropped the Fat Man. The Fat Man was equivalent in power to 21,000 tons of TNT. It was dropped on the city of Nagasaki and experts believe that a conservative estimate of 75,000 people were killed many of whom were killed instantly. Japan finally offered surrender on August 14, 1945, after suffering catastrophic loss in civilian life and devastation to their country. Officially, World War II ended on September 2, 1945. United States General Douglas MacArthur accepted Japan's formal surrender aboard the USS Missouri, anchored in Tokyo Bay. The Manhattan Project, a mysterious cross-country effort to develop the nuclear bomb. Led by Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the Manhattan Project would change the course of warfare forever. 
Now, nuclear warfare has become much more dangerous, much more likely, and much more terrifying. The Manhattan Project guaranteed the Allied powers would win World War II, but it also guaranteed the threat of nuclear war that would hang over the heads of Americans for the rest of time. A simple chemical process that begins with a chain reaction created a chain reaction that continues to terrify millions. Since World War II, the Manhattan Project has left a controversial legacy. In the wake of the end of World War II, a global nuclear arms race began. The United States Manhattan Project sparked influence in other global nuclear programs, including the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France, and many other countries. Since 1947, America was locked in a Cold War. Geopolitical tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States, along with their respective allies, was at an all-time high. This conflict was brought around by a struggle for global influence. The United States and the Soviet Union were allies until World War II ended and Germany was split into two sections. The Western Bloc was a capitalism-based coalition of countries that were opposed to the Soviet Union, and the Eastern Bloc were any countries that agreed with the Soviet ideologies or agreed with communism. The Cold War was called a Cold War because there was rarely any live fire or military conflict between NATO, which was on the side of the, of the Western Bloc, and the Warsaw Pact, which represented the Eastern Bloc. NATO was created in 1949 in efforts to contain the spread of communism. The Warsaw Pact was created in 1955 to encourage the spread of communism. All the tension between the Western and Eastern blocs came to a head during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a 13-day confrontation between the United States and the USSR. This confrontation was caused because of United States missiles being stationed in Italy and Turkey. The Soviets decided, in response, to move similar ballistic missiles to Cuba, which was only 90 miles from the coast of Florida. The Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cold War led to years of espionage and turmoil between the United States and the USSR. But the crisis was the closest America and the USSR would ever come to nuclear war. Both the United States and the USSR knew that the threat of mutually assured destruction was far more dangerous than winning a war. While not entirely historically accurate, this scene from the movie 13 Days does a good job of showing what a meeting between Russian and American politicians would be like during the Cold War. There be no war. At this moment, the president is accepting the terms of Secretary Khrushchev's letter of Friday night. If the Soviet Union halts construction immediately, removes the missiles, and submits to UN inspection, the United States will pledge to never invade Cuba or aid others in that enterprise. If your Jupiter missiles in Turkey were removed also, such an accommodation could be reached. That's not possible. The United States cannot agree to such terms under threat. Any belief to the contrary was in error. You want war? However, while there can be no quid pro quo on this issue, the United States can offer a private assurance. Now, our Jupiter missiles in Turkey are obsolete and have been scheduled for withdrawal for some time. This withdrawal should take place within, say, six months. Of course, any public disclosure of this assurance would negate the deal and produce the most stringent denials from our government. The Manhattan Project's legacy wasn't 100% dangerous, though. 
There were many peaceful nuclear innovations, including sustainable nuclear power and nuclear reactors. That is what the second half of this documentary will be about. There are a few things about nuclear power you should know. While it is very e efficient and gives off zero emissions, it is incredibly complicated. As well, it is very expensive to build new nuclear reactors. This is a video that should put nuclear power into simpler terms. Picture it like this. This stovetop represents stable uranium. It has not been split yet, but it will be soon. Now it's been split and it is unstable and it's providing quite a bit of heat and the heat needs to go somewhere. So this is what the teapot represents, H2O. You see, normally with nuclear power, the teapot would be inst heated instantaneously and all the water would turn to steam. But I use this teapot example to represent the steam that would then go through the turbine. It is very expensive to build new nuclear reactors, as many safety precautions need to be followed. Originally, due to its price, nuclear energy was essentially disregarded. However, in 1973, oil prices skyrocketed due to war in the Middle East, and sustainable energies like nuclear power quickly became very popular investments. More than half of the nuclear reactors in the world today were built between 1970 and 1985. Currently, there are 440 nuclear power plants around the world in 31 various countries. As of today, nuclear energy makes up 10% of the world's energy demand. In the United States, there are 96 operating commercial nuclear reactors at 58 different power plants in 29 different states. Here's a quick fun fact. While nuclear energy only uses 9% of America's electricity grid, it produces just over 20% of energy that goes back into the country commercially. The most common type of nuclear reactor is called a light water reactor. There were three factors of a light water reactor that made it relatively standard versus its competitors, which were that a LWR was available, it worked, and it was cheap to make. It uses nuclear fission to instantly convert water to steam, which is then sent through a turbine that powers a generator. Unfortunately, the LWR is not very efficient, elegant, or even safe compared to its competitors. It was just the simplest. There are two different types of light water reactors. The first is called a PWR, which is short for the pressurized water reactor. The other is called a BWR, short for boiling water reactor. Because both of these reactors use regular H2O, or water, as a coolant, they are both classified as light water reactors. Currently, there are 359 light water reactors in operation in 27 countries. This means that the LWR makes up 81.6% of the planet's nuclear power. In 2016, Unit 2 at the Watts Bar Nuclear Power Plant was completed. Construction on Unit 2 was started in 1973, but it was halted alongside Unit 1 in 1985. While both were 80% completed, only Unit 1 was allowed to be finished in 1992. Unit 1 was completed on January 1st, 1996, and commercial operation began on May 5th, 1996. Unit 2 was allowed to be finished on August 1st, 2007, and commercial operation began in October of 2016. After multiple safety updates and delays, on October 19th, 2016, Unit 2 of Watts Bar Nuclear Plant was the first nuclear reactor since 1996 to enter commercial operation. Modern nuclear energy is constantly being improved on. However, there have been instances of severe danger that have come with nuclear power. There have been three major incidents that have deterred many people away from nuclear energy. One of the earliest, and the first on this list, 
was the Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania incident. Part of the reactor core began to melt, and irradiated water began to flood the immediate area surrounding the accident. This is a news clip taken from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that happened a few days after. It was the first step in a nuclear nightmare. As far as we know, at this hour, no worse than that. But a government official said that a breakdown in an atomic power plant in Pennsylvania today is probably the worst nuclear reactor accident to date. There was no apparent serious contamination of workers, but a nuclear safety group said that radiation inside the plant is at eight times the deadly level, so strong that after passing through a three-foot thick concrete wall, it can be measured a mile away. Gary Shepard reports from Harrisburg. The accident occurred here at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant a dozen miles south of Harrisburg. At about four o'clock this morning, two water pumps that help cool reactor number two shut down. Officials say some 50 to 60,000 gallons of radioactive water escaped into the reactor building and that the radioactivity penetrated the plant's walls. Steam escaped into the atmosphere and radiation was detected as far as a mile away. At least 50 workers and perhaps twice that number were at the plant when the accident occurred. A spokesman admitted that some were exposed to radioactivity and may have been contaminated, but he claimed no one was injured. All workers were given extensive checks with Geiger counters as they left the plant. Reporters were not permitted inside the facility today, but this is what reactor number two's control room looked like last September when it was still undergoing testing. It went into commercial service only three months ago. Officials from Metropolitan Edison Company, which operates the plant, attempted to minimize the seriousness of the accident, saying the public was never in danger. We may have some minor uh, fuel damage, but we don't believe at this point that it's uh, extensive. The radiation levels at the site boundary are really only a tenth of the general emergency level where we normally get to get concerned. We do have our crews out. We're, we're monitoring for, uh, for airborne contamination. The amount that we found is, uh, is minimal. Uh, very, very small traces of uh, radioactivity have, have uh, been released from the plant. But the company's statements have not answered several important questions. How much radioactivity has already escaped from the plant? How high is the radiation level inside the plant? And is there still a high level of radioactive steam inside? The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has already begun a complete investigation into today's accident. Power company officials say it will be weeks, perhaps months, before reactor number two is back in operation. Gary Shepard, CBS News, Middletown, Pennsylvania. Luckily, no one was hurt during the Three Mile Island accident, but the same cannot be said for these next two incidents. In 2011, in Okuma, Japan, the Fukushima Daiichi reactor began to melt down. The accident was started due to the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, which crashed into the power plant and ruptured the power plant, causing the meltdown. This is the moment Japan's nuclear disaster began. A giant tsunami wave crashes into the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, seriously damaging the building's reactors. Crews have been fighting for a month to contain the world's most serious nuclear accident for 25 years. And now Hidehiko Nishiyama from Japan's Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency has revealed new regulations that he hopes will prevent this sort of disaster ever happening again. For each nuclear reactor, there needs to be two backup diesel generators connected to or ready to be connected to the necessary power lines. And they must be ready to be used straight away. On Sunday, radioactive water will be discharged into the sea. Meanwhile, workers are investigating a possible leak from reactor number three. And while Japan seeks to prevent future disasters, international concern is growing over the handling of the current nuclear crisis. This was the world's most serious nuclear disaster since the Chernobyl plant exploded in 1986. This is Pripyat, what was once a bustling city filled with families, animals, and life is now a ghost town. 
The plant life that grows here is poisonous, and the town is still dense with contamination. There is an exclusion zone of 1,004 square miles that covers a 30 kilometer radius. On April 24th, 1986, at 1 hour, 23 minutes, and 45 seconds past midnight, the Chernobyl power plant reactor 4 exploded. The Chernobyl incident is regarded as the single worst nuclear disaster of all time. A massive cloud of radiation directly threatened Russia, as well as almost all of Central Europe. The explosion itself would directly kill 50 people, and more than 4,000 people would die of radiation poisoning or cancer caused by radiation exposure. Ironically, the Chernobyl accident began because of a safety test on an RBMK nuclear reactor. The RBMK was a graphite-moderated nuclear reactor type, which was des designed and built by the Soviet Union. The RBMK uses an unusual design, which utilizes a cylindrical tank surrounding the reactor core, which is all inside of a concrete vault. Each fuel assembly is enclosed in an individual 8 centimeter diameter channel. This channel is surrounded by graphite, which allows cooling water to flow around the fuel. The RBMK had a dangerous flaw, which is what caused the explosion. At the time, every nuclear reactor in Soviet Russia had boron control rods. These rods were raised and lowered as necessary to control reactivity inside the core. However, the tips of these rods were made of graphite, as it was less expensive. On the night of the explosion, power in the power plant was supposed to be reduced to 700 megawatts, so a safety test could be performed. However, xenon had begun to poison the core earlier in the day. The team in charge of running this test intentionally reduced the power, but the reactor fell far below 700 megawatts, and they could not safely raise the power. Unfortunately, the man running the test that night was an extremely impatient man named Anatoly Dyatlov, who, man who demanded the power be raised instantly. This led the team running the test to withdraw all but six of the control rods completely. All of a sudden, power levels began to spike, and the control team did the only thing they thought they could, which was to hit a button labeled AZ-5. This button was designed to return all the boron rods back into place to stop reactivity in its tracks. What the team didn't know was that the graphite on the tips of these boron control rods would immediately skyrocket reactivity. As soon as the graphite entered the core, any remaining molecule of liquid water was instantly converted to steam, and all that pressure blew the lid off the reactor like it was a top on a table. This was the final step towards disaster. As oxygen was now introduced to the radioactive elements, which finally created a fiery explosion. This was a news report that came out on ABC News two days after the Chernobyl explosion. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. The Soviet version is this. One of the atomic reactors at the Chernobyl atomic power plant near the city of Kiev was damaged and there is speculation in Moscow that people were injured and may have died. The Soviets may have been fairly quick to acknowledge the accident because evidence in the form of mild nuclear radiation had already reached beyond the Soviet borders to Scandinavia. We begin with ABC's Dean Reynolds. The first word that something was seriously wrong came from this power plant in eastern Sweden, where workers coming on the job registered abnormally high levels of radiation on their bodies. Although the levels were not high enough to harm humans and no accident had occurred at that plant, it was shut down. And as tests were conducted, similar puzzling reports of high radiation came in from all over Scandinavia. 
but still no accidents were reported, leading to the conclusion that the problem was elsewhere, to the east, in the Soviet Union, a fact confirmed to the Soviet people on television tonight. An official announcement from the Council of Ministers. There has been an accident at the Chernobyl atomic power station. One of the atomic reactors was damaged. The consequences of the accident are being taken care of. Help is being given to the victims of the accident. A government commission has been set up. The civilian plant in question is in the Ukraine. It's something of a showcase facility, featured here in Soviet Life magazine, which extolled its safety record. It's near the city of Kiev, population 2.5 million, and about a thousand miles from Scandinavia, meaning that whatever did occur there, a radioactive cloud headed north across Poland today and into Denmark where radiation levels were five times normal, to Finland, six times normal, to Norway, up 50 percent, and Sweden, illegally high. It's almost certainly the uh, most severe accident that has ever taken place in uh, the short history of civilian nuclear power. That means it is far worse than the Three Mile Island incident of 1979. Experts tonight say the cloud of radiation is now dissipating over the North Atlantic and poses no further threat to anyone. But as the Soviets treat an unknown number of casualties, there's no way to say how much lasting damage that cloud may have already caused. Dean Reynolds, ABC News, London. After months of battling Soviet bureaucracy, scientists like Valery, Valery Legasov were given whatever they needed to contain the spread of radiation. Legasov was aided by this man, Boris Sherbina who was a Soviet politician and was put in charge of the cleanup of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Reactor 4, whose radiation killed thousands, now sits below a specially designed cover appropriately named the sarcophagus. In 2006, Mikhail Gorbachev, the final leader of the Soviet Union, wrote that the Chernobyl Reactor 4 disaster was likely the cause of the fall of the Soviet Union. The legacy left by Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project is complicated. While we don't know what life would be like had they not developed the nuclear bomb, we do know that it brought about destruction and chaos. However, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Nuclear power could be the solution that we've been looking for to global warming and to other major, major issues. To end this documentary, I leave you with what Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer said after viewing the destruction caused by the Trinity test. He knew the world would not be the same. Two people laughed. Few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another.